we can't rest on those laurels. So back to the offensive side, we need to advance our own capability at the same time. We are yep. impeding them. The Chinese will eventually uh, innovate and figure out how to catch up. Hello, welcome to Aerospace Corporation's Space Policy Show. I'm Colleen Stover with the Aerospace Center for Space Policy and Strategy. That was a little snippet of what you'll be hearing about on today's show. We're very pleased to host Alan Estevez, the Undersecretary of Commerce for Industry and Security. In this role, he ensures effective export control to protect and promote US national security, economy, and technology leadership. He'll be talking to Jamie Warren, the Executive Director of the Center for Space Policy and Strategy, about how the changing landscape of geopolitics, the global supply chain, and the technology sector intersect with space, and what the Bureau of Industry and Security does to protect that. So thank you for listening to episode 117. Let's go over to Jamie. Thank you, Colleen. It's great to be back for another episode of the Space Policy Show with our special guest today, Alan Estevez. Uh, Alan's a, an old friend and colleague from the Department of Defense, truly one of the most effective and high impact uh, civil servants of his generation. Uh, Alan, it's great to have you and, and thank you for what has gotta be now coming up on almost four decades of public service. Uh, Alan was an extraordinary, influential player at the Department of Defense as the number two official in acquisition technology and logistics, but he's had a career that really came up through the ranks as a military logistics professional, which was spectacular training for some incredibly thorny national problems that he was charged with leading on um, maybe most famously among them, getting uh, mine-resistant, IED-resistant vehicles out to troops in the field in Iraq and Afghanistan at a time when we were uh, losing lives every day. Um, so, Alan, thank you for that distinguished public service. And we're uh, and excited to see you now in a critical leadership role in the Department of Commerce, where uh, we as a nation are really focused on uh, global competition, and making sure that our industrial security, our relationship with our allies and partners is all part of coming together in a whole of nation way to, to succeed in that competition. So great to have you on, and we're really looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Great, thank you so much, Jamie, and thank you for that uh, too kind introduction. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to be on this show with you. Uh, to talk about uh, what the Bureau of Industry and Security of the Department of Commerce is doing, uh, our role in the aerospace sector, and the things we are doing, uh, managing competition with China, and of course now Russia following the Ill illegal invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, we're in a, a global environment where the challenges are real. And so Commerce Department, Industry and Security, uh, your bureau is in the heart of a whole bunch of things, uh, but the department as a whole and your colleagues over in uh, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, NIST, are um, also driving some really important change when it comes to the semiconductor sector. We, uh, we had last year the CHIPS Act on uh, investing in the semiconductor sector. That's obviously a critical area of the supply chain. It's an area where Export control is a big issue, but now we're really focused on building U.S. Uh, domestic capacity. This has been a huge issue for the space sector, uh, where there's been a lot of uh, supply chain disruption through the pandemic and increasing concern about supply chain security. Can you, can you just give our viewers a little bit of an orientation to how the department as a whole and the administration are thinking about the semiconductor sector? And you know, what we should expect to see over coming years as this effort, this massive effort starts to bear fruit? Sure, I'd love to do that. In fact, I'll, I'll say since I got to this job at Commerce, I have learned more about the semiconductor sector than I ever wanted to know. Uh, from, from the perspective of the administration, from the perspective of my boss, Gene Romando, 
Uh, the way we look at it inside commerce is we have an offense and a defensive side of this. So offense is CHIPS Act. That's ensuring that we have the ability to produce the semiconductors that we need here. That's not to say that every semiconductor that's gonna be used in the United States has to be produced in the United States. But we need to have some capability in the United States to have a diversity in supply chains so that in a crisis, such as we had with COVID, uh, we have the ability to retain and produce chips in the United States. And that includes both mainstream or legacy chips, uh, which we do produce in the United States at some scale today, but we're gonna need to expand that. And at the highest end, the most advanced chips, none of which are made in the United States today. So all those chips are found either in Taiwan, uh, and somewhat in Korea, but mostly Taiwan, over 90%. And we are working with the companies that have those chips to bring production capability to the United States. So that's the offensive side of that. And that is critically important. And we're working that with our partners in the Department of Defense. One of the things I do here is sometimes I act as more or less an interpreter uh, for our former colleagues uh, in DOD. So I'm known to pick up the phone and call Bill a plant and say, here's what this upcoming VTC is going to be about, Bill. So here's what the commerce ask is going to be, and I want you to be prepped to do that. On the defense side, you know, we put out some pretty stringent semiconductor rules uh, with regard to China last October, where we essentially set a, a floor level of the level of advanced manufacturing and advanced production of, of semiconductors that we believe China should be allowed to do. Uh, because at those most advanced levels, that's what's needed for the production of artificial intelligence, which will be a key thing in our military and our economic uh, viability in the future. It's clearly the military is what we're concerned about. And in the production of supercomputers. And the Chinese are using supercomputers for the same reasons that we would for modeling for nuclear capability, modeling hypersonics, uh, modeling you know, all sorts of warfare activities. And of course, at the highest end of weapon systems, the highest end chips uh, are, are required. So we stop the advanced logic at the 14 nanometer node, uh, and we cut off the sales of the highest end GPUs that are used for artificial intelligence, those are graphic processing units, kind of logic chip, uh, from being exported to China. Along with that, we stopped the sales of the tools from the United States that are needed to make those chips. We stopped the components of those tools from being exported to China so that China would have a harder time building an indigenous industry to replace the tools that the US would no longer sell. And we stopped the ability of US people to operate in the highest end fabs in China so that you know, a, a person from applied material, a high end tool making uh, company is needed to calibrate the machine to make the highest end chips. So they lose that capability. And then finally, we work closely with our allies. Uh, we talked to them and we were thrilled that both Japan and the Netherlands who make the highest end tools outside of the United States on their own decided to put on similar controls as we have put on, basically because they share the same security threats that we share and they share the same values regarding human rights that we share. So we've been seeing this um, enormous trend to interdependence in this sector, right? Where different countries and different companies spread throughout the globe are specializing. Do you, do you have a sense of how much progress we're making with these controls and the degree to which uh, we really are changing the competitive environment? Uh, our, our assessment is that we're pretty successful again at the highest end. Now, you won't really know that for a period of time. Uh, you know, they've stockpiled chips. Uh, they certainly do have indigenous capability to design chips. Uh, we restricted the design of those chips being fabricated in Taiwan so that uh, 
even if they can design it, if they meet our criteria, they won't be fabricated anywhere other than in China. Uh, so that's going to impact them over the, the longer term. Uh, we can't rest on those laurels. So back to the offensive side, we need to advance our own capability at the same time. We are yep. impeding them. The Chinese will eventually uh, innovate and figure out how to catch up. So it's, it's a short period of time that we have to keep that innovation going. Uh, for the greater ecosystem, uh, you know, we see companies, uh, again, some of it for supply chain diversity, some of it because of the threats from uh, going outside of China. Uh, and we need to, uh, you know, keep that pressure on. So we, we think uh, these, this has been very successful. And again, we're working this with our allies. Export controls really only work when you do that in a multilateral basis. Yeah, it's extraordinarily complex challenge with so many different uh, stakeholders, both inside the U.S. and around the world. Do, one of the um, one of the areas where uh, this kind of change in global export control attitudes runs into uh, development of individual industries is the space sector, which we, of course, you know, focus a fair bit on here at, at, at aerospace. Um, do you see a are you seeing much pushback from uh, industry stakeholders? Obviously, many industries are much more sensitized to the risk of supply chain disruption after the pandemic. Are, or are most of the people you, you know, are hearing from understanding the strategic environment and the need for the, the changes that are being made? Frankly, you know, and I, I've spent a lot of time going out and visiting the companies that I'm shaving billions of dollars off their their revenue when I restrict sales to China. Uh, but when I go out and meet at the C-suite level, there's a true understanding of why we are doing this. Uh, companies ask me for two things. They ask me for what's the roadmap so that they can plan their business activities into the future without being blindsided by future controls. And to the degree that we can do that, we're going to do that with them. Uh, Sometimes we, like we did in October, we put controls out because we don't want to signal to the Chinese or any other particular adversary what we might be doing so that they don't go out and stockpile while we're, we're figuring out what our regulatory mm -hmm. regime should be. Uh, but we're going to try to work with companies to give them that kind of roadmap of where we're going. The other thing they ask is for fairness and parity. So that if I'm going to stop a U.S. company from doing it, Please make sure that other U.S. companies that make similar product are also under the same controls and that companies in our allied nations are also under the same controls, controls put on by those allied nations. And we're striving to do all of that. That makes a lot of sense. Let me, let me pull you up to maybe even a slightly more strategic level. We are, we're in an environment right now where uh, the, the share of the economy that is federal investment in research and development, that you know, federal-led investment in technological advantage for the nation is, is pretty small, right? It, it's, it's dropped by half as a share of the economy from the space age when we were really driving. And, and that, some of that is a shift in investment to the private sector. And some of that is, you know, we're just, we're spending a little bit less on, on research and development. Um, as you think about that, and, you know, your organization is charged with making sure that uh, private sector research and development and uh, critical equipment doesn't go to places it shouldn't go, uh, but also ensuring that the U.S., you know, the Department of Commerce as a whole, your mission is the success of the U.S. economy. And the success of the nation. So how are you thinking about this sort of shift in where innovation occurs, where research and development investment occurs, and uh, managing the risks that come with that? You know, that's a good question. And of course, we grappled with this when we worked together at DOD, trying to figure out how to tap better into the commercial sector as R&D and innovation flowed out from what in our past had been inside the federal government out into the private sector. Obviously, uh, 
Secretary Carter's uh, may he rest in pieces stand up uh, defense innovation unit in Silicon Valley uh, was part of that. Things like what Will Roper stood up with uh, the strategic capabilities office also tapped into that marketplace. Uh, we need to do both, right? Commerce uh, certainly and, and through things like the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, uh, through the Infrastructure Act, and certainly through the CHIPS Act, uh, is, has grant money that we are providing out to communities to do that kind of R&D. In the CHIPS sector that we were just talking about, of the $52 billion in CHIPS money, about $29 billion of that will go towards advanced fabrication, $10 billion of that will go towards legacy fabrication, and the remainder of it is for advanced R&D. So go back to how do we play offense and how do we increase the innovation gap between us as we put controls on, on our potential adversaries. Uh, that R&D is critically important to that. But at the same time, and frankly, the aerospace sector is a poster child for this, commercial R&D needs to be tapped and brought in to the federal government for use from a perspective of our military uh, and national security and intelligence community capabilities. And we need to do what we need to do to foster that as well. But there's other areas, you know, green technology, that's gonna be the future, uh, battery technology needed for uh, electric vehicles. You know, as I keep saying, an electric vehicle of the future, that today an electric vehicle is like a laptop. Right? Tomorrow, an electric vehicle is going to be like an iPhone. Right? That's the transition that we're undergoing. I'm looking forward to putting my car in my pocket. Uh, <laughs> the uh, so so, Alan, we're we're relying on the commercial sector to a much greater degree, uh, even in areas of relevance to national security. And one of the big transitions that's occurred in recent years is. Uh, more things purchased as a service, right? cloud computing instead of building government data centers or processing centers uh, in the space sector, you know, commercial companies selling satellite imagery on, on a website, you know, to anyone with a, with a credit card uh, subject to certain regulations. Uh, lots of things transitioning to, much more uh, service provider model versus uh, bespoke development or even commercial off-the-shelf hardware, right? So rather than sell you the hardware, we'll sell you the service on an ongoing basis. How do you guys think about that transition and uh, export control and industrial security when it comes to uh, service providers? Uh, another good question. And frankly, you know, there's great benefit to that infrastructure as a service or you know, uh, software as a service. There's also great risk that comes with that as well. So one of the missions that I have uh, at BIS, Bureau of Industry and Security, is looking at infrastructure and the protection of U.S. telecom infrastructure, basically, which includes cloud computing, also includes things like connected software apps. Uh, and I don't want to talk about the one that gets everyone all spun up, but there's risks in that. So we're about to put out a regulation on infrastructure as a service. In other words, people renting cloud space that, uh, and, and it'll go out for public comment, but essentially asking cloud providers to know who they're selling cloud space to. So a know your customer kind of approach. Exactly right. Because what we find is people using U.S. infrastructure to do cyber attacks, both on our own uh, you know, U.S.-based infrastructure, but also using U.S. infrastructure to do cyber attacks elsewhere in the world. And we don't want to be the propagator of that. Um, the other you know, things that we're doing in, in that space, again, you know, we're looking at connected software. Uh, and we're looking at the hardware uh, that goes into that. And then we're looking at, do we regulate foreign cloud providers in the United States and how would we go about doing that? So, uh, you know, China Mobile is a state-owned enterprise with cloud capability, and they don't really have a presence in the United States, but that's now. So what do we need to do to protect U.S. businesses, U.S. infrastructure from doing that? So it opens up all sorts of uh, strange areas. 
The other thing that we're seeing is people not necessarily doing it with US service providers, but around the globe. So going and training AI chips and AI capability on cloud computing capability and data centers outside of say China. So that they're restricted from getting our high-end chips, but they access them through buying it as a service. So we're we're working to figure out how to stop that as well. Yeah, I can see how that would raise some complex issues. Uh, and you know, you talked about the conversations with senior executives in business about decisions you are having to make given the strategic competition that will deny them some part of the market they would otherwise hope to serve. Uh, that gets even more complex when you're talking about third-party nations and uh, access to kind of global services like you're discussing. L let me pull you uh, up to space again some more here. Uh, the, the PRC, you know, has been quite public and articulate about setting key strategic priorities, um, which they revisit periodically in their, in their national plans. Uh, but for the last several years, they've been you know, quite explicit about a goal of displacing the U.S. as the dominant uh, global space power uh, and, and using that as a component of their military intelligence, uh, economic and diplomatic tools of power for, uh, for global influence. It's a long-term goal for them, certainly. And, uh, you know, the U.S. has been doing extraordinary things in space for the last several years, uh, in part due to the rise of the private sector we've been talking about today. But how do you guys at the Department of Commerce think about uh, your role in protecting, enhancing, accentuating U.S. leadership in the space sector? Uh, yeah, again, yeah, another great question in this space. So obviously, you know, NOAA, the National Oceanic Administration, uh, that has the Weather Service, also has the Commercial Space uh, Office for the Department of Commerce to help facilitate the growth of the commercial space sector, and also to get it all, all runs around commercial space situational awareness. As I don't have to tell you, it's pretty crowded up there these days. You know, getting a launch window is something you actually have to get now, because so you don't hit something. As, you, as you're putting your satellite on orbit. Uh, from a BIS perspective, I have two things going on that we need to do in the commercial space sector. One, we're doing an actual industry study. Uh, and you know, I didn't realize when I was at DOD that industrial policy had to come to commerce to get some of the industrial-based studies that we did because we have survey authority for the Defense Production Act to uh, compel industries to respond. So we are doing an industry study of commercial space uh, in conjunction with NASA to get a lay of the land. Who's out there, who's doing what, so that we have a baseline even to start thinking about what we need to do. Uh, the other thing is, and, and I, won't, I won't say I have anything cooking on this, but it is something that's, what is going on that I need to put export control protections on? And if I'm gonna do that, we always do an assessment of what else is available in the world so that, you know, I'm not uh, putting in, in impeding U.S. industry uh, and innovation while uh, letting others uh, advance past us. But there are certain things that could be crown jewels as commercial space grows that we don't want China or Russia and North Korea or Iran, you know, the usual bad suspects to be able to access as well. So the trick is always, how do you control but allow the innovation to go on? And you know, back to the earlier lead-in to your question, as China tries to become a dominant power in space, frankly, I believe it's our own innovation in the innovation ecosystem that we enable in the United States that will keep us out of the frontier. So we certainly do not want to stop that. Yeah, let me, let me jump off two points you made there, and I'll, I'll do them one at a time because they... they kind of drive in two different directions. So first, um, the, the national security advisor has given a couple of speeches in which he's talked about industrial policy issues and, and export control issues. And he's used this metaphor of a uh, small yard with a tall fence around it, uh, which I take to mean 
uh, only control the things that you absolutely need to control. So you're not impeding uh, economic development, innovation in the private sector, but the things that you really need to control, be serious about and, and don't have a, um, a weak regime around. How, how is the department working through those issues when it comes to the space sector? How do you, you know, understand what needs to be in the fence and, uh, and how to make sure the fence is tall enough where it has to be tall? So, you know, and we would go about it in the space sector the way we go about it in any other sector. But let me start off by the fact that the National Security Advisor is out there talking about export controls in and of itself is extraordinary. I I lead in many of my speeches out there with a quote from Jake Sullivan saying, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Uh, And he he does talk about the uh, high fence, small yard, which is essentially what Bob Gates was talking about back when we started doing export uh, control reform you know, around ITAR. So we can talk about whether that's been successful or not. Uh, but you know, the same concept holds true. So to do something in the space area, one, you have to track what's going on in the commercial sector, assess, are we the only people who makes this? What, could this be used for by the Chinese that they don't already have indigenously? There's no point in stopping something that they already own indigenously. And we would do those assessments. I'm, I'm fortunate to have at BIS, which I did not realize until I got here, a pretty robust technology organization who understands this. And then since I've been here, we've also grown our uh, interfaces with uh, the Department of Defense. So we would tap. DOD, you know, I had lunch uh, with Frank Kendall not that long ago, and Frank and I talked about commercial space and the risks uh, that come from that. And we have a robust outreach to NASA uh, on these type of things. So we wouldn't do this blindly by ourselves. We would do this in conjunction with the interagency. Uh, Most of the stuff that I do is frankly, by law, interagency with DOD, state, and energy. Sure. We would do that in conjunction with them and then figure out what controls. The flip side of that is we recently, you know, we're, we're part of a number of multilateral regimes, most of which were set up in the 90s, one of them being the missile control, missile technology control regime uh, that has a lot of uh, stuff in it that regulates uh, space export controls, either through ITAR or, or through the EAR, my, uh, my administration, uh, because, you know, as you know, a launch vehicle launching something into space can also be the launch vehicle coming out of a hole in the ground in North Korea uh, or the live version of that in Russia or China. But we uh, eased our controls on allowing what could go to a foreign country that's going to be launched. We used to put control, a more stringent control on that. we we'll now look at that case by case, which allows satellites to the like to be sold more easily to, again, build up our innovation sector. The, uh, the second point I wanted to dig in on a little bit was that uh, industry baseline study you were talking about. So you said you're working with NASA to, to understand kind of what is the state of play in the industry. I assume that's both domestically and globally. Uh, focus is domestically, but it'll capture globally as well. And so what should, uh, what should the space sector expect to see from that in the coming months and years? Uh, they should be getting surveys. If they have not already, it's going to be done in a couple of phases uh, from Commerce Department, you know, asking like, what is it, what you do, what's you know, your basic business model. Uh, I don't have the details of whether we go into revenue stream or not, uh, but really just getting the lay of the land of what, are you a company? What does your company do in the space sector? Uh, who are your relationships in the space sector? So that we get an understanding who's doing space, space situation and where now. Who's developing launch capability? Who's building satellites? Those type of things. And that'll be the foundation for future decision making by the department and also, I presume, for the rest of government. That's correct. You know, and we want to get past the usual suspects in this space. It's like, who are you know, the small uh, startups that are in the area that might not come to top of mind? 
Yeah, but these are extraordinarily exciting times in the space sector. It's also a time when, uh, in some respects, it's becoming less clear exactly where the sector is and where the where the boundaries are. Right, the companies that are playing in the industry, many of them are not pure play space companies like they may have been in in years gone by, or pure play aerospace and defense companies like they might have been in years gone by much more intersection with the information technology sector and other critical sectors. So that, that'll make for an interesting uh, data collection challenge, I'm sure. Well, look, you know, I, I have an emerging and foundational technology uh, mission set to go out and find emerging technologies. You know, when I got here and I like, said, well, how are we doing this? And I noticed that before I got here in previous uh, administration, they put out a request for emerging technologies in the federal register. And my comment was, you know, people that are doing startups and emerging technology don't know the Federal Register exists. So they're probably not going to respond. So you have to get out there and dig in in order to get the right data on that. I mean, I guess you could hang around Colorado Springs during the Space Symposium and just grab people, but we're trying to be more methodical than that. And it's a, you know, it's a hugely diverse enterprise and many... Many folks are looking to work with the government, but many folks are looking to work with other customers as well and um, maybe hanging out in different sectors. Well, Alan, this has been an extraordinarily informative conversation for me and I'm sure for our audience. Do you have any uh, closing thoughts you want to share with the Space Policy Show viewers? Sure. Uh, Look, again, my core mission is protecting U.S. and allied technology uh, from being used against us by our adversaries. Now, as you know, Jamie, I spent a career building up US military capability. And it's just something that sticks in my gut if I think about our technology being used by an adversarial power against us. So, I mean, that's the core mission set. And when I explain that, frankly, to again, to companies that I'm regulating and shaving uh, revenue off, they get that, right? They get that. They get that the ecosystem that they're allowed to operate in is because we have uh, a national defense and national security capability that allows them. Uh, so when we think about the space sector, again, we want to strive to drive that innovation that is coming forthcoming from the commercial space sector today. Uh, and if we have to do some protection around that, it'll, because, it'll be because we really think we have to. I think our motto here these days, especially with regard to China is, Protect what we must, promote where we can. Protect what we must, promote where we can. That's terrific. And it's clear from the state of your desk, Alan, that uh, you're protecting and promoting a lot of things simultaneously. Um, it's a, a grateful for your continued public service and all, all the impact you're having at the Commerce Department and have had throughout a, a really distinguished career. We, it's been great having you and we look forward to talking again soon. And uh, back to you, Colleen. All right, many thanks to Jamie and the undersecretary for that discussion. I love that analogy that he mentioned about the small yard with the tall fence. It's indeed a tight rope to walk when you have to balance protecting US economic interests while not stifling innovation and fairness. And we're honored he could join us on the show today. So please check out all of our research and events at csps.aerospace.org. You can browse all of our shows on our YouTube channel or your preferred podcast platform. Thank you to James Liggins, our technical director. Until next time, everybody.